Some Prime Ministers have the option of staying vague and drifting with the times. Theresa May won't have that luxury. Her decisions will be made in high definition. Theresa May's premiership may well be remembered for good or ill by how well the Brexit negotiations go. But on domestic policy, she's not inheriting a blank piece of paper. There are three important areas I'd pick out and keep an eye on that might upset her premiership. First of all, living standards. Secondly, the rollout of universal credit. And thirdly, the NHS. This former Office for Budget Responsibility economist explains how these issues have been made more complicated by the effects of the vote on Brexit. The exchange rate has fallen, which means the cost of importing things is now going to be higher, and that's going to push up on inflation and leave less money spare for people to spend on, on goods and services. The second thing that's going to happen is that GDP growth is likely to slow, and hiring decisions will be delayed, and potentially wage growth will be a little bit slower too. Now, both of these things are actually quite bad for the public finances because we need people to spend money so we can uh, ta tax them on those, those spending flows. This is a graph showing what markets expected RPI inflation to be in the coming years before the Brexit vote. And this is after. Now, you can see more than a few years out that they're very similar. But in the very near term, look at the very left of the graph. Inflation is now expected to be sharply higher. This expert from a think tank on living standards explains how this might be a problem for Damien Green, the new Work and Pension Secretary. We've got wages growing at a pretty modest rate at the moment, around about 2%. We've also got a benefit freeze, uh, which means that benefits aren't going anywhere, so any working age benefits over the next few years. So relatively modest levels of inflation mean that for both workers and for those relying on benefits in work and out of work, their living standards are likely to, to start to, to flatline again or even maybe fall over the next few years. One important issue that will affect this is the rollout of the troubled universal credit. It was intended by this point to be helping six million people. The actual figure? It's about a quarter million. This plan to reform a range of working age benefits is way off target. Even before Brexit came along, the government was facing a universal credit challenge. Uh, on the one hand, if it was able to, to implement universal credit, then it meant actually many working age households would be losing out relative to the current system. We were about to start entering the territory of, of postcode lottery, where identical families in different parts of the country would have different outcomes depending on whether on the old system or the new system. Um, but, if it, but if it doesn't work, then that's a, that's a hit to the Treasury, because actually by moving from the old system to the new system, the Treasury stands to save somewhere in the region of £4 billion or so. This analyst from the Nuffield Trust, a health think tank, exclusively reveals to Newsnight her maths suggesting trouble ahead for Jeremy Hunt, who stays as health secretary. Well, NHS hospitals are really under a lot of pressure at the moment. We know they're already missing a lot of their targets around waiting times and access. Um, and at the same time, they have an underlying financial deficit of three and a half billion pounds. So that means that it's costing them three and a half billion pounds more to treat the patients that they have coming in than they're actually being paid um, to treat them. There's no slack in the system. Look at emergency departments where 95% of attendances should be dealt with in four hours. We met that target for bits of 2014. We flirted with it in 2015. In 2016, we've been miles away. So how big a task is it for the NHS to get back into budget for 2020? Two things need to happen. First of all, we think hospitals are going to need to cut their costs every year by 3%. Over recent years, they've only managed to cut them by 2%, and the government's own efficiency review has found that 2% really is the ceiling that can be expected. So hospitals are going to have to exceed that for the next three years running, at least. In addition to that, we're going to need to see a slowing in the rate of increase in NHS activity. So over the recent years, um, at the NHS, there's 3% more work a year. We think we're going to need to see that slow down to about 2%. Now, there are schemes to cut NHS demand relatively painlessly, for example, by putting doctors inside care homes. That could mean that some people get treated before their minor ailments become major ones. But there are also other ways of cutting NHS demands that are more painful. For example, we could just stop keeping up with some of the latest treatment options. We could shut hospitals. We could let waiting lists grow. All of those things would suppress demand from the public for NHS services. But would an electorate that's just voted, it thinks, for more money for the NHS, really wear it? 
The problem is that it's the painful stuff that's certain to save money short term, and the hospital overshoot could reach £5 billion by 2020. Brexit is not Theresa May's only problem.